confession where we just invite the Holy Spirit to come. Here's why we do that. To me, it's silly to do church without the help of the Holy Spirit. You know, if we do that, all we are is just a social club if the Holy Spirit doesn't show up. So we have an invitation where we invite the Holy Spirit. You say, why do you do that? Why do we take time to have this little phrase? Here's why. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That means that Jesus was outside the church trying to get in. That means they were doing everything religiously right, but the head of the church was out on the foyer front porch and couldn't even get in. That means that Jesus will not bust his way into our service to mess it up. He likes an invitation. And so we like to say, Come Holy Spirit and do it for me because I can't do it for myself. How many of you know God's a great gentleman and he's not going to mess your life up against your will? Come on. A lot of us are waiting on God and God's waiting on you. He's waiting on us. So this is why we do this. We say, come Holy Spirit, we invite him and we believe he can do a great work. Up on the screen with me, hold your Bible in the air. Place your hand over your heart. I know we all make pledges, but this is our pledge at the church. Now let's say it together. Here we go. Come Holy Spirit. Have your way in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. I'll never be the same again. Shout it now. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. Give a shout. God is a good God. I'm going to ask my wife to come up for just a minute over here. I want her to share with you about the women's retreat that went on and just kind of give you a heads up of what happened. Last week, the ladies went off and had a great time and left all us men here by ourselves to fend for ourselves and eat Lucky Charms, and it was wonderful. But uh, she came back with a lot of good testimonies of what God is doing and what the Lord did. And I would just like her to take a minute on Mother's Day to sort of share with you some things that are taking place in the ladies and what happened last week. Well, we had a wonderful time. Can't tell you everything because what happens on our retreats stays at our retreat center. So, no, we really did have a good time. Um, And the thing that blessed me the most this year is um, through the years at Believer's Church, our women's ministry, um, both before I got here and as well as the first couple of years that I was here, um, primarily reached um, women my age and older. So if I say older, that means I'm included in that. So, But it primarily reached just my age and older. And this year at our retreat, I was so blessed because we had about five 20-somethings that decided to join our group. And, and what that said to me is that we are reaching the generations, that we have kind of made a shift and a turn um, where we are bringing in just some, some younger people and that we are not only bringing them in, but that we're able to reach them. They participated with us and everything that we did, and we just had a a really, really marvelous time. And from the youngest of us to the oldest of us, God showed up. And I know it's a little intimidating. I didn't realize how intimidating it was to spend a weekend with women until I began inviting you all to come. And the looks on your faces were just like, you want me to what? Spend a weekend with just women? So I'm not sure if we have a testimony as women to be gossipy or backbiting or contentious or competitive or all of those things that, that mark us as groups of women. But I can promise you that at our retreats, none of that is accurate. There are not pockets of people just, yeah, yeah, and there's not a lot of drama. There's not a lot of the things that you normally think of when you think of a group of women together. It is a time, every, every time that we've gone, it's been a time that we've been able to love on each other. We've been able to share our hearts. Um, there have been testimonies of things that have happened on the way, just even in the car. Somebody even spoke to me yesterday at the women's breakfast that just her conversation with the other women in a car on the way up brought a deliverance to her and that it set her free in an area of her life. So I encourage you, if you have never been with us on one of our retreats, we don't do them quite annually. I think we did one maybe a year and a half ago, and then we did this one. So periodically in the fall or spring, we do a a women's retreat and we just ask I just want you to all begin to ask yourself if you want to join us on our next one the theme for the weekend that we just had was brave and we studied about Gideon and his life and we tore down altars from our past that kept us from pressing into what God had for us and how many of you have went who went feel now like you're you're a lot braver than you were that things were shaken off of you can you testify to that amen so we are ready to do whatever it is that God has for us and we're excited about it amen. so had a good time Thank you so much.
Well, I have the privilege of preaching to you on Mother's Day today, so I know I'm not a mother, but I've, I've been raised by one, and she did a wonderful job, and I live with five women in my home, four daughters and a wife, and so I feel motherly a lot, but uh, I believe God's given me a good word this morning and has been challenging me, myself, uh, to, to really ask the, the hard questions. How many of you know sometimes you've got to look in the mirror and ask the hard questions? And so I ask the hard questions. What is all this about? What is this thing we call church all about? We gather together, we gun on a corner, our, our preference typically, our church, our denomination, we, we go where we prefer. But it makes me ask, why? Why do we do what we do as Christians? I think the further we go in life, we're realizing that American Christianity as we knew it 30 years ago is changing drastically. And that makes me as a shepherd have to try to look in the scripture and say, how are we going to answer the things that are facing us for this generation? The things that I deal with today, uh, 30 years ago when I was a youth pastor, are astronomically, exponentially different than what I dealt with in the 1980s and 1990s. The things that are going on, the questions young people have to answer today, this generation. And the church has to keep up to make sure that we're doing what God has called us to do. Because we cannot patty cake around as Christians if we want to see a generation have revival. We've got to stick with what's real and what's right. Now here's my opinion to that. God, based on what news you follow, whether you're seeing ISIS that is coming across the Texas border, or we're going to vote the Supreme Court for same-sex marriage, or you're going to be beheaded in the next five years on American soil, and you watch people stomping flags, and you see all of the, the, uh, the social violence and cultural violence on TV as we picket and march and burn things down and fight. And uh, Typically, wherever you watch on TV your preference, you will see something along that line. You will see something that can instill fear, that can instill anxiety. Am I going to be persecuted? Are they going to come across the border? Are they going to blow something up? Are terrorist groups? What about all the stuff going on in the, in the news in Baltimore, various places as we see violence against society and society fighting and cultures fighting? And, but it makes me say this. I don't think God is surprised. I don't think he's sitting on the throne going, what in the Sam Hill am I going to do with these people? I never thought of this. I never thought they could get this bad. I wish I would have seen this coming. I could have done something different. If I would have known this, I would have done something other than send a Jewish carpenter. I would have sent him a star. I would have sent them something that would blow the mind of every young person today. If I would have known there was going to be YouTube, I would have waited and sent Jesus when they could have taken selfies of every apostle and had his resurrection on YouTube. Why didn't I think of that? I'm God and I missed it. I missed the generation that's going to be taking pictures of everything. I mean, can you imagine what it would have been like if Jesus was alive today? Everybody's following him around. People are standing there with their iPads filming him while he walks on water. He's got his own Vine account, his own Instagram account. He probably wouldn't have as many followers as Lady Gaga, but it would be close. It would be several million following Jesus on Instagram, and he would be taking selfies of two fish and then selfies of all the fish that came in. And we'd be like, this is crazy, this guy... But, but the question is, if you're God and you know it's going to escalate and get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, how many of you are older than 60? Raise your hand. I mean, you've got to be bold with it. Come on, be proud. Yeah, be proud to be old. How many of you that are older than 60 will say this generation right now is different than the one you grew up in? Okay, good. Totally different. Uh, just watch television. It'll tell you how different it is. But... The plan of God never changed. And God is not up there going, i got to come up with plan B for this generation because this is worse than I thought it was going to be. So there's something very spiffy and brilliant about God that says 
The work I wanted to do was going to be different than technology, different than religion, and it would transcend every generation regardless of the power of sin, regardless of how wicked it gets, the plan will always and still remain the same. And the plan is, and this is what I'm going to spend the next few weeks or maybe even a month teaching on, the plan is Jesus Christ in the flesh, crucified, dead, buried, and risen again in heaven for you, and he's coming back riding a horse one day. And that plan is, is a plan that is still valid for this generation. I know they don't see Jesus on YouTube, but there's a difference between a YouTube visual cue and a heart that has been translated by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because once the heart is touched, you don't need an Instagram account to know he's real. You don't need to see him on Facebook to know there's something real about this dude named Jesus Christ. John chapter 4 I'm going to be spending several weeks ministering out of the Gospel of John. Uh, I've actually kind of enjoyed, since my birthday when I turned 50, I started doing what girls do. I thought, well, I've lived 50 kind of doing the man thing. I'm going to try what all these girls do. And I started journaling. I know, guys, don't be mad at me. I know that seems so sissy, but I started journaling. I thought, what better way to end my life than to start chronicling every day that I'm alive and what God shows me every day. Because I only get you once a week, so I get to throw out what God's been showing me, but I ask God to show me things every day. So I've kept a journal every night, and I write down every thought I've had in my own personal life and every thought I've had about God. And about four days ago, I wrote down, in my journal. I'm feeling this strange pull to read the Gospel of John. And then I wrote, because I believe there's something about Jesus God wants us to know. And I started thinking on this Savior I call Jesus. And asking myself, has church become more narcissistic, touch my needs, answer my prayer, fix my problems, and it's become more about me than church about he. And so every message focuses on fix me. Everything that we do can revolve around make me happy, help me be better me. But the reality of it is what I find in Scripture, and I'm preaching to myself now, I find in Scripture, die to me so that he can live through me because I'm dead to me and the me that is alive is not even me that's living but it's Christ in me, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I, but Christ lives in me and the life I live, I live by faith in Him. That is a dynamic relationship going on. And it's a relationship of somebody's on a cross and somebody's coming up out of the grave. And the one on the cross is me, and the one coming out of the grave is me, and it's Jesus working through me. So that's been in my life and in my mind, and now I want to take you, starting in John chapter 4, on a journey this morning about a woman who met Jesus. I'm going to read the chapter through to the story, and then I want to make some comments about what I think is going on. And... um, I'd like to title it this. I'm not a big title guy, but I feel stirred to say the title. So write this down. Whatever happened to her water pot? Whatever happened to her water pot? It would be the title I would give it today. Let's read John chapter 4, verse 1, ESV version. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near a field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus underlined this, very important. Jesus was wearied as he was from his journey. He was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Here's the comment on paragraph number one. He's going into Samaria. Samaria is a no-no land. If you're a Jew, you stay out of Samaria. It's like going to the wrong neck of the woods. 
It's being on the wrong side of the tracks. You don't need to be here in this land. Samaritans were considered half-breeds. They were not pure Gentile, they were not pure Jew, and they were hated by people. Literally despised. This is racism at its finest. And Jesus decides to break the cultural barrier of racism and go on a journey through the middle of Samaria, which is a no-no. So we're, we're kind of at this point. My comment to that is Jesus can break any barrier in your life that he so deems to break. A woman from Samaria, which is even worse, came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, see she's confused, how is it that you, a Jew, not a man, a Jew, you're not supposed to talk with us, would ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, parentheses, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. In other words, this is against our culture. You don't need to cross the barriers here. We don't even need to be speaking. This is not what we need to do. Jesus answers in verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband over here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not even your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Let me just throw this. This is the Mark Evans translation of that. Jesus Christ is really not all too concerned with your past. Because he did not come to make you better. He came to make you different. He didn't come to take your past and fix it. He came to bury your past and raise you up brand spanking new. So your past doesn't bother God at all. I know people tell me, well, you just don't know my past. I was a drug addict. I did this. I've slept with 20,000 people. I've been married for Who cares? That's why Jesus came. That's why he's here, and he's not biting his fingernails over how horrible of a person you were. Let me go ahead and help you out. The fella in a suit and tie that's never had a tattoo or smoked a joint is just as wicked as you are. Because without Jesus Christ, we are all evil. And bound to hell. So I don't know who that was for, but don't ever fret your past. Just rejoice that Jesus kills your past and resurrects you brand new. So there is a theology of Christianity, though, that says God just forgives my past and then deals with me. It's the AA mentality. I once was a sinner, and I'll always be a sinner. Once a sinner, forever a sinner. No, 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 no. Once a sinner put to death in Christ, brand new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. You're not a couch made over, you are a brand new sofa. You're not even what you used to be. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when she starts saying, he says, well, you've had five husbands. He's not making fun of her, he's just getting her attention. Because what he's going to do in her has no benefit at all on whether or not she's had a, a horrid past or not I, you know I, I don't know who that's for but I just feel that it may be even for me because I used to sit around and think the other way well I've never been arrested I've never smoked dope I did one time in high school the room started spinning I asked God I'll never do it again if you'll make the room stop spinning he did I did and I've never done it again so medical marijuana good luck the room's going to spin on you all right, now watch this. He said to her, Sir, give me the water so I'll not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband. I, I have no husband. You're right. You've had five of them. 
Now, verse 19, the woman said, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. Now they're starting to argue over religious ideas. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem you, will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. That's powerful to me. You worship what you don't know. That to me is just religiosity at its finest. I go to church, I sing the songs, I read out of a hymnal, I listen to some guy preach for 30 minutes, I go home, I ain't even got a clue what happened. But I do it every week because it makes my conscience feel better. God did not give us the church to ease the conscience from a guilty five-day weekend that you just had. God gave us the body of Christ whereby we could know Him. So it does tell me that it is possible to be religious and yet not know him. That what we do, we just do out of tradition, but there's no life coming from it. In other words, I've been worshiping on this mountain for years, but it's not changed the fact that I need a sixth husband. In other words, I do all the religious things, but my life is no different than when I first started my journey. So to me, true Christianity is easy to spot. If you're different you've met a real Jesus. If you're the same old person struggling with the same old things, it would make, have you really met, do you really know this guy we call Jesus? All right, now watch what he says. The woman said, verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. (gasps) Woman, man, oh God, this is horrible. I can't believe he's talking with a woman. He's going to defile himself. They're very religious. They're the inner circle. They're the little Jewish club that have formed around them. You know they're egotistical, and they're ticked off that a woman is taking his time. And so this is what they say. What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left the water jar. This is our title. So the woman left her water jar and went into a town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. All of them start coming now. We've got to go see this guy. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then the harvest? Look. Everybody underline that in your Bible. Just underline the word look. I'm going to draw a parallel in a minute to it. Look. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you've entered into their labor. Many Samaritans, and underline this in your Bible, verse 39, we will end here. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. A woman with six husbands changed an entire city with a horrible testimony because she met Jesus Christ. Never think that the past you have is not going to have some validity in your future. The past that you have, no matter how terrible it's been, how many poor decisions that you have made, or how horrible choices that you have made, Rest assured that the moment your past meets the Savior of the world, there is nothing in your past that is going to be wasted for a testimony in the future. You have to know that the horrible choices, the decisions I have made that I'm ashamed of, that I hide, that I don't want anybody to know, the dark secrets that I keep within my own heart, rest assured that when you meet Jesus Christ, All of the darkness, all of the evil, all of the hurt, all of the shame now becomes a testimony that will change your entire future.
for other people to know Jesus because he's going to redeem the past out of your life. Come on, somebody needs to say amen there. That's a good amen point. Jesus is going to redeem the past. Now, he doesn't just forgive your past. I'll never think about it anymore. He redeems the past. Redeeming the past means he's not ashamed of you and your story. He's just going to get the glory out of your story. Everybody look at the person next to you and say this. He's not ashamed of my story. He's just going to get the glory out of my story. Come on, one more time. He's not ashamed of my story. He's just going to get the glory out of my story. See, that's where you have to get to as a Christian. You have to get to a Christian. I had a friend of mine. I used to do ministry with him all the time. Jay Hazlett, a good friend. And uh, his arm was just loaded up with tattoos. Now, I still have virgin skin. I've never, been, I've, never, I've never been evil and demonic and got tattoos and going to hell. So, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm really, really pondering one if I can talk my wife into it at age 50. I thought I'd go out, but then I was afraid I might have to go visit my dad in the hospital. But, but he, he was all tattooed up, and I was doing ministry with him, and I love, you know, I love, I love hearing people's story. Like, if you go out with me and the waitress is, is waiting on me and they have tattoos, I always ask him, tell me the story. Tell me the story on your arm. Why did you get that? Why did you get this? I love hearing that. Now, he had a tattoo. I love his answer. And on his shoulder was a cowgirl who was, uh, how shall I say it in church, almost naked, sitting on a fence post with her half-naked body and thigh, her breast hanging out, holding a six-gun pistol. And I, we were sharing a room together, and so when he took his shirt off, I was like, dude, let me see that tattoo. And I almost felt like I needed to repent after it was over. I was like, oh my God, that's like Playboy. I mean, it was this voluptuous woman sitting on a thing, very sexy, holding a pistol with every God-given part she had exposed. And I'm like, wow, that's a... I said, man, I said, listen, this here comes my religious. You ever thought about, like, going back and letting them put clothes on her? <laughs> That's literally what I asked. I, I just thought, well, hey, you know, you're, I thought, you know, put some clothes on her. It's still a cool tattoo. Listen to his answer. I love it. I love the answer. He said, oh, I got her before I got saved, but when I got saved, she's born again now. That was the best answer in the world. Oh, she used to be a sinner, but she's saved now. Isn't that awesome? He so believed in salvation that when he got saved, his tattoos got born again too. Oh, she used to be evil, but not anymore. And see, but, but, but why clothe it? Why? It's a story that I can tell. See, in other words, God has taken my life and he's redeemed it, and now it's a story that gives the glory to God. God has changed my life. What I used to be, I am no more. I have been delivered and set free. Now, this is where we have to come to as Christians. Because we don't, we say it, but we don't really believe it. My story will bring him glory. Because we gossip, we talk about you, we stab you, we want you to be perfect and excellent. You can't fall apart, you can't have a problem. You can't smoke cigarettes, you can't chew, you can't get tattoos, you better not cuss, you better read your Bible, you're going to go to hell. And, you, and so what we have is a whole conglomeration of Christians who are not getting any glory out of their story because they're ashamed of their story, because if their story comes out, they're going to be ashamed and they're going to be deemed as not perfect and not good enough for Jesus and not good enough to go to church and not good enough to be accepted and not good enough to be loved. I've slept with 20 boys, I've had sex my whole life, I've been molested, I've been raped, I've been abandoned, I've been abused, I've been left to dry, and now I come to Jesus and I just sit over in a corner and I'm too ashamed to even tell you what I've gone through because it just hurts me so much. No, 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 that's a lie of the devil. Hold your head up and say, I have met the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I was molested, I was raped, I was abandoned, I was left high and dry, my husband cheated on me, my wife left me, I've been addicted to drugs my whole life, I've been in and out of church but let me tell you since I have met Jesus he has redeemed my life and now I have a story that I'm going to move to the front row and say I can tell you what God has done for me and I'm not ashamed of that anymore that person is in a ground dead 
and this person is alive, but the person that comes out alive can tell you the stories about the person that has died. And I've met a good Jesus. So this is what happens to this woman. She begins to really tell the story of church growth. Church growth happens and the kingdom of the devil begins to literally shake in his boots the moment you start realizing, I have a story to tell. The thing that we have done wrong in American church is we let the evangelists do the evangelism during revival week. And we try to get everybody to come to revival week and, and listen to the evangelists tell us about Jesus. No, 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 that's American Christianity going to rise. The greatest evangelist in the room is your story. Come on, you missed that one. The greatest evangelist in the room is your story. It's the story that you can tell. I have never been addicted to drugs. But if somebody in the room has, guess what? God's going to use you to talk to drug addicts. God's going to use you. I've never been an alcoholic, but if you have, God's going to use your story to tell people. I've never been abandoned or molested, but if you have, God is going to use your story to minister to those people to listen to you because your life is going to touch a segment of people who say, God can't identify with me. I'm too dirty for God. I'm too, I'm too, God would keep himself from me if he knew my dark secrets. And then God wants to put somebody in your life and go, oh, honey, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me see. I, I can talk to men. I, I, I've cheated before. I, I've lived. I, I've, I've been drunk before. I, I've made bad decisions. I, I can talk. That's my story. I can tell you what God can do. I can tell you how God can use you in miraculous ways, even when you fell in. But the lie of this generation is you have nothing to say, and God will never be proud of you, and God will never use you until you become perfect. Until you clean your act up and get your act together. But I got news for you. Jesus is not biting his fingernails about you this morning. He's simply saying, if you'll just give me a chance to redeem your story, I'll get the glory. You have to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself. And to tell your story the first time may feel like shame. I remember the first time I ever told my story, it was real shameful. I, I spent most of my time apologizing. <laughs> oh, forgive me. I'm so sorry. Oh, Lord. And I thought, apologize for my story? I love what my mother said. She's got, she's old. She's got, I would, <laughs> well, I mean, she is old. I'm 50. But she's up in North Carolina preaching today. She had her little chicken neck. You know what a chicken neck is? That's where old people get that, I guess. But, but my daughter, Stella, was flipping her chicken neck. And, and, she, and Stella was like, what's that, Grandmama? And, and she was flopping it. And then as she held her arm up, she said, well, you get this too. And she did that, and her little skin was flopping on her. And Stella said, what is that, Grandma? And she said, well, that's what happens when you get old. And she's like, ooh, really? She's like, yeah, this happens. And so Stella's flapping the flap, and Mama's jiggling her arm, and, you know, and I'm just grossing out like, ah, you know. But, I, but, but my mother, when Stella left, I said, Mom, did you ever think about, uh, you preach all the time, you're in public, did you ever think about doing Botox and facelift and breast lift and all the things that we do today to keep up, to look better? And she said, well, no, not really. She said, I figured it this way. God gave me this body, and he knew what it was going to look like when I got older. And so she said, why did I want to change that and get up to heaven and God say, who are you? And I thought, I thought well, that's pretty good. She said, I don't want to get up to heaven and God go, who are you? I, I don't know you. You don't look like the woman I created. So I started laughing, and then she said something profound. Profound. Blew my mind profound. She said, why would I want to get rid of all these lines and wrinkles? I earned every one of them. Holy smoke. I earned every one of them. She said, all the wrinkles. She said, I earned them praying. I earned them crying. I earned them raising you boys. I earned them fighting for the faith. She said, why do I want to get rid of them? Because every morning when I look into the mirror, it reminds me I have a story to tell. Holy smoke. I mean, I, I, I got, look at my arm, stand, my arm hair standing up now. I, uh, Jennifer Lopez, I got goosies. And uh, I thought, man, if this generation could get a hold of that. Now, I'm not against facelifts and you looking better if you want to. But you have a story to tell. 
You have a story to tell. It wasn't even my message this morning. I just feel like to tell you, you have a story to tell. And you sitting around in a nightclub pouting, trying to find out your own personality and find... Look, get out of the club, get into Jesus Christ, and let God begin to redeem your life so you can tell a testimony of how you've met Him. Now, yeah, come on, give God a praise. Now, here's something I, I want to say that's touched me and I've been thinking about. What happened to her water jar of this woman married six times, faking it, hurt, miserable, obviously has a terrible testimony in town. I'll tell you this, I don't know if she has a bad testimony, but every man knows her. Because the moment she comes back and goes, go hear a man that told me everything I did, every man in town went out to go meet him. So I kind of got a feeling she's hooked up with a lot of brothers. In other words, she's gotten busy. So they know who she is. They know she's the hooker. They know she'll sleep with about anybody. May, I don't know, maybe she needed money. Maybe she was the town prostitute. I don't know, five husbands. Maybe she was needy. Maybe she was insecure. Maybe she was chasing something her whole life. But here's what I know about her. That day she came out with a water pitcher in her hand to do what she had done all her life. And she says to Jesus a question that intrigues me. She sees Jesus and she says, he says, give me something to drink. And she says, you don't even have a water jar. How are you going to get something to drink if you don't have a water jar? And the well is deep. So what that tells me is that she was living her life off of logic and experience. How can you draw water? You don't have a pot. And the well is deep. I know because I come here every week and get water. It's deep. You don't even have a rope. What are you going to do to get down in there and get it? So she tells us something about everybody's story. God is trying to take you to a place outside of logic and experience. He's trying to get you to know Him on an intimate spiritual level, not just on a logical experiential level. He wants to do something in your life. She goes all religious on Him. Well, she starts talking about the well and the religiosity of the well, holding her water pot the whole time. And then Jesus identifies the real need. You've got five husbands, and the one you're with now is not even your man. She puts her water pot down, and then the disciples come and begin to yang yang, and she walks off. And when she walked off, my little brain started doing flips. Wait a minute, you forgot your pot. That's what I'm thinking while I'm reading it. Wait, why would you even put that in here? Is it that important? You left your pot. What are you doing? You, you're going to have to come, you're going to need the pot for later. You're going to need it for next week. So I started asking myself, maybe she's forgetful. Maybe she's ADD and doesn't have medicine. Maybe she put the pot down and forgot I even had a pot and went running off to the town. Maybe she, was, maybe she was embarrassed because the men started talking about her being a Samaritan woman, so in embarrassment, she put her pot down so she could get out quicker because she's embarrassed to be talked about. I don't know why she left her pot, but you better believe my little mind started doing flips. Why did the Holy Spirit put that piece of information in that she left her pot and left? She didn't take any water with her. She just took off running and let... We don't even know if water was in it. We just know she left the pot. And this is what I've come up with. The pot on the ground shows us the deity of Jesus Christ. Because the first thing in the top of the, of the text that we read is Jesus was hungry and He was thirsty from a long journey proving His humanity. And when she took this pot and left it, she left it, in my opinion, this is only opinion, I believe she left it because she wanted to make a statement that your needs, Jesus, of being thirsty overrides my need of shame. Your needs overtake my own. And I think that that is the mark of a truly changed Christian when you begin to say 
I just want you to bless my pot before I leave. Fill my pot up with water. Bless my pot. Turn my pot into gold because you're Jesus. So I can take my pot back and give everybody in town water out of a gold pot that's now worth a lot because you touched my pot. And I'm going to have to come back. I'm never going to let go of the pot because I'm going to need it next week when I come back. So what I'm learning out of this is there are certain things in God that He's saying if you hold on to it, I can never do what I want to do. Why? Because Christianity is not about a narcissistic, four-leaf clover, lucky rabbit's foot Jesus. And a lot of what we have about Jesus today is a narcissistic, four-leaf clover, lucky rabbit foot Jesus. Do this for me, God. Do that for me, God. Do this for me, Jesus. Answer this prayer, Jesus. Fix this for me, Jesus. Please do this, lucky Jesus. Give me three wishes, Jesus. Be my genie, Jesus. Fix all my problems. Fix all my woes. Fix my car. Fix my battery. Fix my tire. Fix my lawnmower. Fix my marriage. Fix my children. Fix my health. Fix it all for me, Jesus. Be the great fixer. He loves that. And he can do that. But the beauty of Jesus is when you walk and you realize, wait a minute, he's thirsty. He doesn't even have anything to draw with. He's God. Couldn't he walk on the well water? Couldn't he just call the water up out of the well like a fountain and drink? He is God, by the way. But she takes her pot, she sets it on the ground, and she walks off. And I believe, I, opinion only, I believe that when Jesus, the woman has left the scene, and Jesus goes into his discourse, and he backs up and the disciples are going, aren't you hungry? You haven't eaten? You haven't drinking a thing all day? We went into town to get food. You don't even have any water. And Jesus' lips are parched from the desert and the heat and cotton mouth and trying to swallow from all the heat. And this is what I think happened. He said, look! For the fields are white with harvest. One sows, and then another one reaps. I gave her life, and she gave me what she had. I sowed my life, and she gave me her water pot. And she went back to do a testimony. But when Jesus began to make the connection, I believe he said, Look, the fields are white with harvest. Lift up your eyes. Why? And then they started looking at all the men coming from the town. Coming to see this guy called the Savior of the world. And there's this analogy between an empty pot and a woman who changes a city. Why? Because I believe in her she got what the true meaning of Jesus Christ is. The true meaning of Jesus Christ is His need, His desires, His thirst, his hunger override me any day of the week. And if I just give him what he needs, I can have life forevermore. So that it becomes the, the testimony of the will of God over my life, not my will. His will. God, what do you need? You're thirsty. Take my water pot. Your, your lips are pots. Take my water pot. It's all I have to give. It's the only offering I have. Please forgive me, prophet. I'm, take the water pot, please. I don't have anything else to give you. It's the only offering I have. I'm a broke woman. I live with five men. I have nothing but shame, but that's all I have. That was the thing I was coming to draw water with. It's the only thing I have, and I leave it at your feet, and you can have it, and she takes off running. But when he mentions it, look, it's proof that the harvest is coming. This empty pot is proof that the harvest is coming. And what she came out here to do is not what she left with. Because she left it all at my feet. Because she understood that the only way to live life is that my needs override her own. And I think the testament of the American church today if we want to see revival, we've got to stop being narcissistic Christians and start saying, God, whatever it is you need, whatever it is you want, whatever it is you're after, use me. And let my life be the empty vessel that you say to the world, Behold, the harvest is here. Use me, God. I have a story to tell. Stand up with me, if you will, this morning.